Okay, so now we are live. Um, I am going to try and um, update the Google Plus page. I'm Julian Chevalier. I'm the curator of education here at the Nasher, and I know we've got a couple minutes before we're supposed to officially start. I'm going to. And I'm going to turn off the background one. All right, so many things to edit. All right. So, Marshall, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Marshall Price. <laughs> I'm the Nancy Hanks Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Nasher Museum of Art and also the Coordinating Curator for uh, Miro, The Experience of Seeing, uh, an exhibition of paintings, sculpture, and drawings uh, that is scheduled to open here at the Nasher um, in just a few days. Excellent. All right. So hopefully um, all of the folks who were planning on watching participating. I'm realizing that I had a little technical difficulty uh, with the difference between the Hangout and the Hangout on Air. So hopefully everybody has shifted over to the Hangout on Air. I just posted a link. Um, and hopefully I'm not frustrating too many people. But you guys are awesome for hanging with us. Um, I'm going to check a couple of other things. Um, Marshall, why don't you tell us a little bit of, while we're while we're waiting for the last few minutes? Um, tell us a little bit about the installation of the exhibition because that's just happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anything exciting or unusual about that? Um, well, the installation, um, the exhibition itself comes from uh, the Reina Sofia Museum in Spain. It was organized in conjunction with the Reina Sofia and the Seattle Art Museum and was in Seattle just recently on view. Um, the show itself is comprised of 51 works and it will be, uh, it is installed currently, uh, we just finished the installation um, in uh, one of our large pavilions and that's the Johnson Pavilion. The Johnson Pavilion. <laughs> Marshall is uh, one of our newest employees. We're so excited to have him on staff, and so still learning all the different named spaces at the National. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are many. There are many. <laughs> We're grateful to all of our donors. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the the installation actually is a didn't have there were no hiccups mm -hmm. along the way. It um, it fit into the space. Uh, it's, um, I would say, probably a fairly large group of works to go into that space, but it, it fit nicely. Um, there are several of Miro's sort of more monumental paintings, paintings that are over 100 inches high. Um, How many feet is that? That's super um, big. Yes. <laughs> well, let's see. Not being <laughs> proficient in math uh, is one of the reasons why I'm an art historian. Now, we should not continue that mythology that art <laughs> and math do not go together. So, again. <laughs> no, that's But that's they're true. big. That's they're true. taller, than, taller than us. Very, right? very big. Oh, yes. Very <laughs> okay. big. Yeah. So, yeah. bigger than human size. Yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. Was there anything that you, I know you had seen it in person in Seattle, but when you saw some, is there one of the artworks that you saw here and were like, oh wow, now I see it in a different way? Well, I mean, you know, the funny thing is, every time you see an exhibition installed differently, you begin to see different relationships between the works in the exhibition. So, um, for example, you saw the exhibition mm -hmm. in Seattle as well, and, and um, it's installed completely differently here. Uh, that's not always the case with exhibitions. I mean, sometimes if an exhibition travels, uh, the curators may try and recreate the, inst the or be as faithful to the original installation as possible. Mm -hmm. In this case, we didn't have quite the space that Seattle had, so... Um, Marshall has worked miracles to fit artwork <laughs> that was in, what, three times the space? At least. At least. At least. Into yeah. our gallery, yeah. so that's super exciting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I guess since it is officially time, we'll go ahead and get started, and we will reintroduce ourselves. I'm Julian Chevalier. I'm the Curator of Education here at the Nasher Museum of Art at Duke University. And I'm Marshall Price. I'm the Nancy Hanks Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art 
here at the Nasher, uh, and also the coordinating curator of the exhibition, Miro, the Experience of Seeing. So we're going to get a brief introduction to Moreau today. Um, I am going to scoot out of the image and let Marshall take over, and then he's going to um, pull up some slides to give us a, a little background on Moreau. We hope that this is a good introduction for anybody who's going to come and see the exhibition, because as I'm sure Marshall will point out, um, the exhibition focuses on the last 20 years of Moreau's life. Before I go any further, though, um, I just wanted to mention that this is an experiment for us here at the Nasher to try out these Google Hangouts. So Marshall's a good sport for, he's new, we tricked him, <laughs> um, for trying this out with us. But these little kind of lunchtime sessions where you can get a little taste of an exhibition, maybe an artwork. Um, so we've got a couple of others coming up. Uh, Wednesday, October 8th, also at 12.30. We're going to try and get either an iPad or a camera onto some wheels, and we're going to follow Mar Marshall through the exhibition. So we'll get kind of a virtual walkthrough. And then um, on December 17th, also at 12.30, we'll do um, kind of a focus on a couple of artworks, so get really in-depth with those. All right, so I'm going to pull up, actually, Marshall's PowerPoint so that we get that. And all right, so now everybody should just be seeing um, the PowerPoint presentation or just the slides. So Marshall, you can and you can advance with the arrows. Like okay. Really okay. So yeah, as we were saying, the the exhibition is comprised of 51 works, um, all coming from the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, and all dating from the last 20 years of Miro's life. So it's uh, a really wonderful opportunity to to take a, a close look at this late the late career of one of the 20th century's great modern masters. So in this presentation we really just want to take a look at how uh, Miro goes from this adorable young man um, of around 1900 to um, the artist who created the works in the exhibition, the, the mature artist that he was at the time, and hopefully lend some context to the exhibition because I think some people still have trouble sort of grasping um, some of the themes and subjects that are found in Miro's work. So Miro was born, Joan Miro, in Barcelona uh, to a middle-class family. His father was a goldsmith and a jeweler. You can see on the map here where Barcelona is located in, in the northeastern region of Spain, uh, also known as Catalonia. Here's a shot of uh, a panorama of Barcelona with the Gaudi Cathedral in the foreground. And Barcelona was one of three geographical regions that played a tremendous role in, in Moreau's development uh, throughout his career, as we'll see. The second geographical region uh, to which Miro really owed a great deal was the region of Mallorca. It's an island off the coast of Spain. Uh, Miro's mother was Mallorcan and as a young boy he traveled there uh, frequently on holiday with his family. And some of the earliest surviving artworks that we have by the artist are these drawings that you can see on the right here of the windmills of the Mallorcan countryside. The third geographical area that had a great impact on Miro, the artist, was Montroig, a hillside town, a medieval town south of Barcelona, uh, where he lived uh, beginning as a, a teenager. Um, and we'll see uh, very quickly that as the young artist develops, uh, Montroig plays quite a role in terms of his visual development. On the left is an aerial photograph of the Montroig countryside um, where we can see the agricultural rows of, of various plantings. And on the right is one of Moreau's earliest mature paintings uh, titled Montroig Vines and Olives. And you can see very clearly the, the, the connection, the visual connection, the aesthetic connection between um, Miro's sort of stylization of the landscape and the actual landscape on the left. 
In the early 1920s, Miro moves to Paris, the sort of center of the art world at that time, and becomes associated with uh, the Surrealist movement. Uh, the Surrealists were a group of artists and writers who were interested in unlocking the unconscious areas of the mind to tap into um, an unfettered type of human creativity. Uh, Miro was associated with the Surrealists, but never really uh, a card-carrying member of the club, if you will. He, he sort of kept them at, at, at arm's length. Um, but it was around this time, and it was, it was through his interaction with the Surrealist artists, that he, he began to create this visual vocabulary. Um, and this is a typical painting, uh, the Hunter Catalan Landscape. Um, created by Miro in the 1920s. And you'll see, you'll notice these small shapes, abstracted shapes and forms that he uses uh, to, to, uh, in the creation of his visual vocabulary. And I'm just going to jump in, Marshall, please advance the slide, but I'm just noticing that um, sometimes there's a little bit of a lag between when you advance the slide and when it comes up. I see. For other people. Okay. So if anybody's having that problem, just be a little patient and we'll try and slow down um, those transitions as well. Okay. And um, we're going to just jump ahead a little bit, somewhat like a cooking show. <laughs> uh, and by the 1930s, what we see happening in Monroe's work is it's becoming uh, quite dark. Um, and ominous. And, and that's really, I think, in response to uh, several things. One is that Spain is in the midst of a civil war uh, beginning in 1936 um, until 1939. And then by the late 30s, it's clear that Europe, uh, that the specter of war is hanging over Europe and, and will soon descend on the continent. And so we can see in works like Nocturne, um, a very dark sort of approach to, to the landscape. It's also around this time in the late 1930s that Miro begins to work in sculpture. And sculpture plays an enormous role in our exhibition, The Experience of Seeing. Um, but sculpture was, in the 1960s, nothing new for Miro. It dates back to his days uh, in Paris uh, in the 19 in the early 1930s and even uh, into the late 1930s, as you can see with um, uh, this assemblage sculpture, um, Sunset Object from 1937. Miro leaves, actually leaves Paris and, and moves to the countryside in Normandy to escape uh, the coming German invasion. And it's there that he begins perhaps his most famous series. And also, I would say, um, the work for which he is perhaps best known, and that's the Constellation series. It's a series of uh, fairly small uh, gouache paintings um, that he began in the French countryside in 1940 and continued into 1941. Um, when they were shown in New York uh, in not long after they were finished, they were a great critical and commercial success. And um, while Miro had been exhibiting up until that point, they were uh, sort of only further underscoring his, his international um, importance at that time. And here we see one, one of the late, later works from the Constellation series, The Day's Awakening, from 1941. But it's really after the war, and even after 1950, um, where our story begins, when Miro moves to uh, the island of Mallorca off the coast of Spain, and really begins on a journey that takes him to new creative heights. Um, he moves into a brand new studio designed by his friend Jose Luis Sert, and for the first time in many decades, he's able to gather his body of work together and actually review it, reflect on it, and become inspired by it. Uh, one of the ironic things that happened, however, is that with his brand new studio, for the first time, this enormous studio, he has this great big space to work in, 
um, he decides to put painting aside for several years and focus primarily on ceramics and printmaking. Um, from about 1956 to 1959 or so. I'm just going to have you pause there for a second, Marshall, to let the slideshow catch up. Actually, hit the, I next, see. Hit the next one so that we can hopefully move on. Um, but yeah, there's like a good five to ten second delay. Hmm, I see that, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll keep an eye on the, um, on the, on the delay and just to make sure that we're I'm talking about the images that are in front of people's screens. And it was kind of important that that architect designed that space. He was, was and is very well known, is that right? He was, he was yes, he's a very well known architect and a fellow Spaniard and a, um, a fellow Catalonian, if I'm not mistaken. He was for many years head of the um, architecture department at Harvard um, during the 1950s. He, and we'll probably touch on this in one of the later um, hangout sessions, but he also designed uh, the Spanish Pavilion at the World's Fair in 1937 and uh, a number of other important um, important uh, um, buildings during his lifetime. So Miro moves full-time to Mallorca in the mid-1950s, um, installs himself in his new studio, um, and I think in some ways reconnects with the landscape. And here are two photographs of the artist uh, during one of his walks on the beach collecting objects, which he then will bring back into the studio um, and provide inspiration to him in the creation of sculpture. There were uh, many aspects of the landscape that Moreau engaged with. And coming up on the screen shortly will be uh, several photographs of um, other aspects of the, the Mallorcan landscape, the, the rust, rustic Mallorcan landscape that really did inspire Miro. And when you see these images uh, in context with his work, you begin to understand just where he derived his inspiration from. These were not photographs that Miro himself took. Most of these come from uh, uh, an art historian uh, who visited Miro in the late 50s and wrote a um, book uh, on Miro named Walter Erben. So we see the, the sort of reeds and the knotted uh, olive tree uh, and also coming up on the screen uh, will be um, a stone uh, object from the landscape and a root or some sort of driftwood um, and then, as we advance through this, we'll, we'll see just how uh, these objects in the landscape inspired uh, the sculpture, much of the sculpture from beginning in the late 1960s um, that's included in the exhibition. It's just jumping ahead here. We've still got the reeds, and, and there, there, there are the, the stone uh, and the uh, roots. Um, um, and you begin to see as you move ahead, and maybe I'll maybe if I go through these a little bit yeah. more quickly, they Perfect. will um, they will go go more quickly on the on the uh, be broadcast more quickly. Yeah, you begin to see there um, Bull's Head from 1970, one of Miro's uh, very important works in the exhibition, um, and how similar in form it relates to to this olive tree um, that. Uh, Miro's friend, the art historian Walter Erben, saw in the countryside near his studio. Um, moving ahead, okay, <laughs> let's see. Uh, technology, our best friend or worst enemy. There we go, and, and this is another um, nice comparison, I think. Uh, it's again this Walter Erben photograph of um, some stone shapes in the landscape. Um, juxtaposed with the Miro sculpture, and this root or piece of driftwood um, with this large, the largest sculpture in the exhibition, Miro, uh, woman uh, from 1968. 68. Yeah, yeah. And you know, one of Miro's friends, Joan Prats, had this wonderful quote about Miro. He said, when I pick up a stone, it is just a stone. When Miro picks up a stone, it is a Miro. Mm -hmm. Um, and so 
we're moving ahead just slightly to uh, this painting here, one of the earliest, the earliest work in the exhibition from 1963. And we can see that um, this, there's a strong connection in the exhibition between painting and sculpture. And Miro worked across disciplines, um, but in very similar ways. And when you see the paintings and sculpture in, in dialogue with one another, you begin to see just how uh, closely connected the two of them are. And so here we see um, person in front of a landscape from, uh, as I said, from 1963, uh, very abstracted work, although not completely abstract. And in, in fact, Miro um, himself always said that his work was not abstract and uh, rooted in representation. Um, but what he does is he abstracts these forms. So um, we just have to look closely at them to discern uh, the horizon line, the outline of a figure, um, and also um, use some of our uh, some of our imagination in terms of, of reading the work itself. The next work, uh, Bird Woman Two, is part of uh, a couple works that Miro. Uh, well, we're just going to jump ahead. Just <laughs> hold on. We're going to um, stick with. There we go. Uh, Bird Woman Two from 1977 is uh, one of two larger works in the exhibition and also very closely related to, to sculpture, uh, as you'll see in just a moment. Um, the bird and the female figure were, were uh, common themes for Miro throughout his life, uh, beginning um, really at his earliest stages in the 19-teens. Um, but here we see uh, uh, an emphasis on the, the dark outline and drawing, and um, also um, this strong connection with sculpture when the sculpture image does pop up here on the screen. And while we're waiting for that, I'll just point out a feature to everybody that you may or may not have noticed. If you um, kind of mouse over to the left side of your Google Hangout window, you should see some icons available to you. Um, and you should be able to find a Q&A box, or you should actually just be seeing the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. Anytime you have a question, a query, a comment, you can type in there, and we can um, see it. And we may hold till the end of the presentation, but it's there. And so you can see now um, in this comparison, well, that just <laughs> changed, um, that um, there is this close connection between painting and sculpture. And this, this actually, this comparison is a really wonderful one um, to, to look at, because it's got uh, really the painting in the exhibition that is maybe his most iconic from this period. Um, it's, an, it's an homage to uh, his Picasso. fellow Spaniard Picasso. Um, and the title is um, uh, Woman, Bird, and Star, Homage to Picasso. And it was finished on the day of Picasso's death, uh, after which Moreau uh, dedicated it to his good friend and actually great inspiration to Moreau, Pablo Picasso. In the exhibition, it's shown very closely with this sculpture figure from 1969. And you'll notice that in both works, the artist has taken a sort of collage-like approach to creating the works um, and using, uh, using collage, in a sense, to, to make both compositions. But just to return to Mallorca and Moreau's childhood um, and backtrack to illuminate his perhaps most important symbol that he uses throughout his career. Um, as I said, Moreau created a whole series of, of drawings of windmills in Mallorca as a young boy. And these windmills really begin to form the basis for uh, Moreau's most important and most often used visual vocabulary symbol of the star. And when you look at this over the course of his entire career, 
you can begin to see just how um, these early uh, experiences led into the creation of Miro's visual vocabulary. On the left is a, a photograph of a typical windmill, and then now we're looking at two um, of Miro's other early drawings of windmills. How old was he when he was? Doing? He was approximately 10 years old when he started doing this, and these are his earliest surviving works. These these drawings of the Mallorcan countryside. Um, he he also did drawings of of the countryside without windmills in them, um, but you'll see that he begins to use and incorporate this star shape beginning in the 1920s um, with these very sparse abstract paintings that you see here. Um, but as we move through, we can see in each decade how he's incorporating this star shape into his works. So by the 1930s, when the next slide comes up, we'll see that he's included them um, in the paintings. So we're just waiting for the next slide to come up here. And um, there it is. And uh, even more abstract work from, from the late 1920s, um, this, this work, 48. Um, and then into um, the 1930s, And um, he uses the star in a number of different ways. He, he uses it, at, there we go, and we, we have it as an actual star in some cases. We have it as um, a very abstract shape. On the left is a work from the 1930s, and on the right is another of his constellation series, um, one of which we saw earlier on, um, and again, probably his best-known series, and really his 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 uh, sort of best known period. And then in the 1950s, on the right, um, we can see there's a star in there. Um, over the white dot? Over the, over the white dot, and, and just above that figure's head, too, um, next to that moon, that crescent shape. And also into the 1960s, in a painting that looks very much like color field painting. Um, um, and then finally, I think, yep, there we go. Uh, Red, red circle and star uh, from 1965. Um, we see the, the star shape uh, there in the upper left-hand corner, just above the orange circle shape. And then um, even into the 1970s, which we can see here, in a much more playful composition, uh, this figure uh, with arm raised and star in the upper right corner. So the star is an important symbol for the artist for more than 50 years and used throughout uh, in a number of different ways, um, really in a kind of poetic evocation of celestial realm, um, the juxtaposition between the earthly realm and the celestial realm as well. And then finally, and to uh, conclude with our images today, uh, we come to uh, one last image of the artist in his studio, surrounded by all of his late work. Um, this was Miro toward the end of his life, a wonderful shot of the artist in his studio. Um, and we're just going to click through two slides to show the image credits for these, the images that we've shown at this point. So we give everyone their proper credit. You can always email us if there's ones you can't see and you're dying to know what an artwork is. Through yeah, okay. and that's the last image credit page, right. which will appear shortly on your screen. <laughs> awesome. So, are there any and quest? Sorry, thanks everybody for our technical challenges as we realize the delay. Thank you for your patience in that. And also, I realized um, that I had a little mistake between 
hang out and hang out on air. And so if there's anybody who's watching, every time you'll see a little flash of other people participating in the Hangout. Um, if all of you who are watching um, but are not me or Marshall, <laughs> if you could just mute yourselves, that would be great. That way, um, because Google is so smart that whenever you make a noise, it automatically goes to your screen. So that's why we were seeing little flashes, because people are clearing their throats or doing things that humans do to create noise. Um, are there any questions out there that folks would like to type into the question box? There must be questions. <laughs> well, I'll start out. What was what was one of the most surprising things that you learned about Miro in the process of this exhibition? Well, I mean, I would say that you know Miro is one of these artists that uh, everyone studies in graduate school to some degree, but uh, it's always focused on that surrealist period of the 1920s and 30s. And this exhibition, and so, you know, when I, when I started um, work on the exhibition, I sort of thought, oh boy, you know, here we go, I have to kind of um, be subjected to a, a modern master late in his life who you know, maybe was resting on his laurels because I was not familiar with the work at all. Um, but I was so surprised at the quality and the, the continual um, desire to push the creative boundaries uh, that the all of the work in the show is a complete revelation to me. Um, so, I mean, that's been the biggest surprise, I would say. Mm -hmm. What's here? I know it's like choosing children, but do you have a favorite or one that you keep going back to again and again? Well, I mean, there is that iconic painting in the show. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of the signature image. Uh, that's maybe one of one of his his. <laughs> yeah, there we go. You know, one of his better known works from this period. Um, the sculpture, though, as a as a complete body, was also a revelation because I, I knew him as a painter, I knew him as a printmaker, um, I knew he did sculpture, but I didn't. You know, the the late sculpture I knew was sort of that painted sculpture, mm -hmm. um, but bright primary colors. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and and um, and you know, this work is not painted; it's patinated, which uh, is very different. It has that bronze color as you saw in the in the slideshow. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, I mean, the sculpture in general was a complete surprise for me, really. And so there's the exciting process of knowing that he cobbled all these things together, assemblage with stuff that he found on the beach and in the trash, we can assume. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then had it cast in bronze. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there's that extra step of... of challenge just to just because oh and the fact that he also um, carved into the wax maybe talk a little bit about that yeah so most of the sculpture in the exhibition was created using the lost wax technique which basically um, requires the artist to create a wax positive mold of the sculpture um, and for Miro this allowed him to incise into it to draw into it to add his hand to the object before it was cast permanently in bronze. And so even in the sculpture you see him using this same visual vocabulary that I talked about before of uh, the star and other various shapes uh, repeated throughout the exhibition. Awesome. Well, I'm sad nobody asked a question, but um, the presentation is out there. We hope you enjoyed it. We do also hope that you will um, come out. Oh, maybe there's the, in the chat version. Ah, uh, we were looking. Ah, uh, oh, Jessica asked, is the um, is the exhibition open now? Will you remind us, Marshall, um, when it opens so to the, the public? So the exhibition opens to the public uh, this Sunday here in Durham, North Carolina. Um, and that date is September 14th. 
14th, 14th, 15th, 14th, it's on the poster. 14th, 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 right. Um, and you all are extremely fortunate because the exhibition will be on view through February 22nd. So it's a, a very long run. Um, it's the first time that this material has ever been shown in um, North Carolina, if not the entire southeastern uh, region of this country. Um, and it may be the only time that any of us get the chance to see all of this work uh, from the Reina Sofia together in one place without going to Spain. So it's a great opportunity to, to see um, the work of this modern master. A visit to Durham is much cheaper than a visit to Spain. It is. And we have excellent restaurants if you're visiting from out of town. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you so much, Marshall. Really appreciate it. And I hope everybody else uh, you know, enjoyed it as well. Marshall has great information and um, such great images, too. Reminder that we'll be back October 8th for a walkthrough. Um, so join us for more fun technical exploration than that, where we're going to try and put the computer on wheels. Um, it'll be a good time, right? It's an yes. experiment. Yes. We're trying to be casual and fun with this. It's excellent. <laughs> All right. So I hope everybody has a great day. And um, you can also check out the amazing website for the exhibition, nasher.duke.edu slash, is that a slash or a backslash? I think it's back. Backslash, Backslash yeah. Miro, M-I-R-O. Yeah. So check out that website. It's beautiful. Got a lot of great information and images. So. And and supplemental information as well. There we go. You yeah. can find out more. Yeah. All right. Should we wave goodbye? Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you.